After it is designed, but before it can be occupied, a building must be constructed. This is the story of the construction of Paul Milstein Hall at Cornell University. Unlike some other construction products that may be produced far from the site and then transported great distances, concrete is almost always a relatively local product. Its primary constituent ingredients, sand, gravel, cement, and water, can usually be found close at hand. So this would be little stuff. This is lightweight aggregate. Uh -huh. Could be um, used um, sometimes for lightweight concrete sure. uh, as the coarse aggregate. Gravel. This looks like is all number one stuff. Oh, yeah, small stuff. The regular weight. To see how the concrete for Milstein Hall was being made, I took a short drive to Saunders Batching Plant, right off of Route 366, just outside of the city limits. Saunders supplied the concrete for Milstein Hall's caissons. Concrete for the foundation and dome was supplied by the Robinson Vitale companies. Enormous bins in the plant store various sizes of stone, sand, and specialized additives like fly ash. Most of these materials are stored outside and moved on conveyor belts to the bins as they are needed. The plant actually, you know, it'll convey material up into the plant. The plant will actually hold maybe uh, 60 yards worth of material before he has to keep replenishing it. Uh -huh. So, Quite a bit. on a busy day, he's busy in the loader all the time, reloading and so on. Computer programs based on state-sanctioned mixing protocols automatically combine the ingredients according to the required design strength and other site conditions. Back in there, then blown into the cement tankers and then brought here and blown into here. So mm -hmm. the aggregates, the sand and stone, we actually buy locally from a quarry not too far from here, right in Freeville. Uh -huh. um, and are they quarrying it locally? Yep. So they just... Mm -hmm. Admixtures for air entrainment or color are also added at this time. Um, liquid color is a lot more consistent and um, mixes better. You don't have a lot of the companies that make color put them in these bags that are um, dissolvable, supposedly. So the bag and all goes right in the truck and it's supposed to dissolve, but. Sometimes it doesn't, and you've got paper that's paper bags that are in somebody's floor. And, uh, so it's sort of like uh, it's mixing colors, like different. yellows and the blacks yeah, and the reds and the different colors. That Interesting. In combination, can make over 650 different colors. Concrete. concrete mixing trucks come into the batching plant, back up under the bins, which dispense sand, aggregate, add mixtures, and water and fill up with the required ingredients for the next job. So inside the building with the sand and the stone and so on that are in the weigh hopper and once they're weighed, then they feed in and, and drop right in down through the chute there. To, there's, there's water inside that drum. Right. And now he, the driver, one of the things has to come back and say to the batch guy, I've, uh, I've got 30 gallons of water in my drum. Once the concrete arrives at the construction site, various tests are performed to ensure that it meets the specified design standards. A sample of freshly mixed concrete is isolated from the rest of the batch to test for air entrainment, slump, compressive strength, and water cement ratio. Here we see the test for air entrainment. The basic idea is this. Water may enter the concrete through small fissures. The water, left to its own devices, would freeze and expand, damaging the concrete. Air entraining agents create tiny air pockets that act as safety valves for water that works its way into the concrete, so that when it freezes, it can expand safely into these small bubbles. After the base is filled with concrete, leveled off and covered securely, water is added so that all air is displaced. Air is then pumped in to a predetermined pressure marked on the dial. What are you testing for here? Uh, being trained air. The percent of entrained air can be read on the dial, the whole thing based on the principle of Boyle's Law, air pressure and volume being inversely proportional. A measure of the concrete's workability, and by implication its strength, is taken with a slump test. 
If there is just enough water for the chemical reaction that occurs with the cement, the concrete will be too stiff and not workable. But if there is more water than is needed for workability, this excess water will ultimately evaporate, leaving large air pockets or voids that weaken the concrete. Both of these extremes can be deduced from a small or large amount of slump, respectively, which is measured after the cone is lifted up from the wet concrete. So is this about what you're looking for? Yep. Two tests are then performed using cylinders of concrete. In one series of tests, cylinders of concrete are taken away from the site and brought to independent labs. After they are stored and cured for 28 days, they are placed in crushing machines where their strength is measured. Most of the Milstein Hall concrete is specced at 4,000 pounds per square inch, a fairly typical value for this kind of project. A second test using the cylinders tests the water-cement ratio, which is linked to concrete strength, by using a microwave method technique that essentially heats the fresh cylinder of concrete until the water in the mix evaporates. Uh, what we're going to do uh, when we make some cylinders, we'll do what they call a water-cement ratio. Yeah. You know? uh, what we're going to do is we're going to do it by microwave method, uh, which we basically do is you, know, you do the, uh, the fresh concrete weight, the dry concrete weight and the pan tear weight. And then, you know, you do that little calculation, you'll find the unit weight of the concrete, and then that'll give you uh, the microwave content, uh -huh. water cement ratio. So out here it's supposed to be a 0.45, theoretically, but we're never that, so nothing's never perfect. Right.